so first things first, um, be, be prepared to have your head kind of twisted a little bit. Because of the induction proofs, inequalities are generally regarded as one of the hardest. It's part of why there are so few inequality proofs actually in the HSC. We've been doing the HSC in its current form for like 30 years. You guys are like the last ones to go through in this syllabus. And even in that time, just have a look at the bottom of the page. That's how many of this kind of question that I could find. They're not common. What other kinds of induction proofs do you already know? What have you looked at over the past few days? Divisibility. divisibility. Prove that some whatever expression is a multiple of three or is divisible by five or whatever. Divisibility, what else? Series. series. Series and sequences, right? It's like prove that this sum of things, sorry, this series of things will add up to this thing for n equals etc, 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 right? Do you know any other kinds of induction proofs? There are some fun, um, there are some fun geometry proofs which are, again, uncommon. Um, for example, you can prove by induction that the angle sum of a polygon with n sides and an n gone has an angle sum of that, which you already knew, but you can prove that by induction. That's kind of a nice, neat sort of thing to do. It's the same idea. I can build up from like a small shape, a triangle, and then I can go to the next one and the next one and the next one and keep on building up. So there's many different kinds. But inequalities kind of require the most extra thought because you're already familiar with series and sequences, right? We did a whole topic on that. You know what it means for something to be divisible, but you've never really had to prove things with inequalities, and that's why I've got this big preamble, okay? So here's my first point. Make sure you have a sheet of paper on the way in. Don't walk past the chair, don't walk past the chair. It's got a piece of paper on it, thank you. Um, you're going to do lots of things to inequalities that are just like what you've done for years with equations, right? It's like I've got a thing and then I mani manipulate both sides and then I get an answer at the bottom. Except, in a really big way, and I'm going to outline a few of them actually, inequalities are the opposite of equations and you kind of can tell from the name. Like that's, it's like we're saying they're not equal. So you can't do everything to an inequality that you do with an equation, okay? First example. We've got, if A equals B, right, let's just take any two numbers. Then, for instance, I could multiply both sides of this by negative 1, right? And this is, you can put this in that uh, top left hand uh, blank cell there, right? This tells you that negative A equals negative B regardless of what A and B are equal to. They could be numbers, they could be functions, they could be anything you like, okay? You multiply both sides by negative 1, no problem. But this is not always the case when you think about inequalities, right? Over on the right hand side now, right? Let's think of a really straightforward inequality, like say, I'm pretty sure negative 2, sorry, yeah, I'm pretty sure negative 2 is less than 1. You agree with that? You happy with that? Negative 2 is over there on the number line and 1 is over here. But watch what happens when we multiply both sides by negative 1, just like we did over here. What am I going to get here? 2, and then over here I'm going to get negative 1, and that's not less than negative 1, right? So this is like the classic example, when you multiply by negative 1, what should I actually do to the inequality? What happens to it? It's going to switch direction, right? Now this switching of direction, so I should actually write 2 is greater than negative 1, this switching of direction is the thing you have to watch out for, because of course equations don't have a direction. You write A equals B, you can write b equals a. It's the same thing on both sides. But it's not the case when you say, for example, this is my first one. When you multiply by negatives, watch out. Okay? All right, secondly, so here's on your second row. Which one did I have second? If you've got a equals b, then just like multiplying both sides by negative 1, you could also take the reciprocals of both sides. Yeah? You happy with that? Um, if you knew that these two things were equal, then when you divide one of them through by 1 and the same, you'll get the, the same thing, right? Hmm, what should we say here? How about on the right hand side? Three is less than four, right? Last I checked, three is less than four. <laughs> Seriously, within the calls, you have to question yourself. When I take the reciprocals of both sides, watch what happens. I'm gonna get one third and one quarter. That is not less than, right? Again, you're actually going to have to switch the direction. So you can't just simply do the same thing to both sides. And one last example. Oh yeah, that's right. This one becomes very important, right? Lastly, I think that's the right number of rows. You have three rows, right? Here we go. Here's the last one. You can multiply both sides by negative one on an equation. You can take the reciprocal of both sides. You can also square both sides. 
You do have to be cautious because if, for example, you got something like x equals 5, you square both sides, x squared equals 25, and you introduce an extra solution. But it's still true. It's still true if x equals 5, then you square it, you still get 25. That's true. But let's think of an example. Can you think of an example I gave you to here where when you tried to do the operation, it broke down? Can I give you 30 seconds? Just write your own something you know to be true, something you know to be true. And then can you square both sides and come up with something where it doesn't land? Let me give you a brief moment to have a think about it. See if you can think of an example. Just square both sides and see what happens. Is it consistent? Is it not? Think about that for a second. Has anyone come up with something? A pair of numbers, get an inequality, you square both sides and then it breaks down. Today you're, you're nodding, what have you got? Or you're nodding to yourself for a different reason. <laughs> oh, I could what did you get? Negative, yeah. Like five squared, less than two. Okay, negative five you're saying is less than two? Yeah. That, and we agree with that, yes, that's true. And then you squared both sides, what happened? Yeah, so you got 25, and then four. And you're like, wait a second, that is not less than, right? And it's probably helpful for us to know that's, that's negative 5 squared and that's 2 squared. So you did do what you were supposed to do, but again, because of, it's really the signs that are messing with us, with us and also the magnitude of things, right? So here, like I keep on saying, right, you say, oh, when I square both sides, depending on the sign of both sides, you may have to uh, change the direction of the inequality. Like so. So do you see what I mean, right? These things are not the same as equations. They're quite different objects. Now there's one other way which I've got underneath here, which is really important. Oh, yeah, that's right. Um, which is to say that because you have the two sides not being equal, that's what an inequality means. They are not the same. They're kind of more, and I was struggling for a word for this. So if you, after I explain this, if you can come up with a better word for this, please tell me, but I call them kind of flexible, right? So you can see there I've written 100 is greater than 99, right? Which we're all happy to say is true, okay? Now if this was in equation land, right? If you do something to one side, you must absolutely do it to the other, otherwise it breaks down, it's not an equation anymore, okay? But that's not true for inequalities, watch. I'm just going to subtract one from the right hand side, just because I feel like it, 98. But I don't have to subtract one from the right hand side, from the left hand side, and it's still true. Do you agree? It's like, hey, this thing is bigger than this. You can make this smaller if you like. You can make it smaller and smaller and smaller, and it's all still true. This is really weird. People look at this in the working. Like you'll go and look up solutions for this, and you'll think, how did they just change things on the right hand side? Think about it. What you've got is a big object over here on the left. These things can keep getting smaller. You can make them as small as you like. Have a look at the uh, right hand side. I've got a different example for you, right? You can see I've got 7 and 8. Because I've got 7 on the left hand side, my inequality is going not greater than, but lesser than, right? Hmm. Can I keep on getting things smaller on the right hand side? Can I say 7 is less than 7? No, I can't, can I? But I could go in the opposite direction, right? I could, for example, instead of subtracting one, just because I felt like it, I could maybe add one instead. That's still true, isn't it, right? I could keep on adding, I could make this as big as I want. These things, because of the direction of the inequality, they can keep getting bigger. So this is a little, Strange and unusual, right? We're not in equation land anymore. Even though we're going to do, as you'll see, a lot of things just like we would with equations, in these particular ways, it's particularly because of these different qualities of inequalities. I didn't mean to say it like that, but because inequalities are different in these ways, the proofs we're going to do are going to feel very different, okay? Does anyone have any questions on either of these two points? Okay, let's get down to brass tacks. This is all general in terms of... Um, in terms of inequalities. Now let's speak specifically about induction. There are basically two ways to do this. I like to call them method one and method two because I'm very original in the way that I name things. Okay, 
And these will be things that you've sort of seen before, but I'm going to try and state them in an explicit way, because otherwise you're like, where do I even begin? Okay? So when we think about induction, there are three main steps, right? Can you tell me what the three main steps are? What's the first thing you always do? Test. We're going to test, right? What exactly are we going to test? We're going to test the first value for the statement that you've been given, right? And often the first value is n equals 1, but it doesn't have to be. In fact, have a look at the um, bottom of the page. You can see for most of those questions, um, and in questions you've encountered already, the first value doesn't have to be n equals 1. So you test your base case. That's the first thing. After that, you... Yeah, you make an assumption, right? You're like, uh, oh, I haven't written anything on the board. In those statements there, everything's to do with n's. That's meant to be a generalized number. Let's pick a number. Let's just call it k. You make the assumption. And then your last step is, after you've tested, after you've assumed you... Okay, we, we're going to test out, right? But we actually don't know. Like, in some ways, you can't find it because k is like, who knows what k is, right? This is where the real work begins. You have to prove that everything is actually going to work for k plus 1 if it works for k. So this is always the acronym, the acronym that's in my head, right? I'm just going to, like a, like a list of dominoes, right? You tap it and then it all goes. That's the way induction works, okay? Now, method 1 and method 2, very overall, they kind of look at these two steps. You're going to start from one point or another, okay? So method 1 is begin from the assumption, right? You know for most of the um, proofs that you've done so far, you kind of look at this k plus 1 thing, and then you like twist and turn it so you can find the assumption in there. And then you, you, know, you do a substitution and you say by assumption. Okay? This one, your first line is just the assumption, and then you start working with it. Okay? That's method 1. Method 2 is instead, when you've got the, uh, the k plus 1 step, right? you state the uh, k plus 1 case as everything with k's your function of k, every single thing you see with k's in it, in the k plus 1 case, you put it on one side um, of the inequality, right? You state it as this is bigger than this, or less than, depending on which way you've got your question stated to you. State it as that, and then consider that left-hand side.